Today on Hitch 20. The flu could be right underneath our noses. Hitchcock's TV episode, Lamb to the Slaughter. She's alone in the scene. There's nobody for her to talk to. Darts her eyes up and down, left and right, left and right. We actually watch her just exist in that moment. Plus, how did Hitchcock pick his stories? I wish I could help you more. Much has been said about the 52 feature films that Hitchcock directed. But nobody talks about the 20 television episodes he also directed. The Hitch 20. Alfred Hitchcock claimed that Lamb to the Slaughter was his best half hour. And he added, with pride, I shot the whole thing in two days. This is the set layout for Lamb to the Slaughter. Hitchcock made use of the depth of this set in order to create tension for the audience. In the living room, Patrick declares that he's leaving Mary. Hitchcock follows Mary's reaction as she walks to the garage to grab a frozen leg of lamb. She grabs the lamb, and the camera captures her long journey back through the house. The moving camera causes us to feel an emotion and empathy for Mary's reaction to events. She puts this piece of evidence in the oven for dinner. So by composing the oven in the background throughout the rest of the film, it allows the set to increase screen tension. Each time the police walk toward the oven, she gets tense. I want you to go outside right away and comb every inch of the garden. Have those fellas out there help you. Film director Alfred Hitchcock was quite choosy about the stories he directed. Lamb to the Slaughter is probably his most famous episode of television. It even received an Emmy nomination for Best Directing. The reason this episode resonates so well is perhaps because it's a story of perfect irony. As based on a short story and then screenplay by Roald Dahl, a Roald Dahl would be somebody that my generation would know from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and James and the Giant Peach. I first read Roald Dahl's uh, Lamb to the Slaughter when I was in middle school, and I don't want to tell you how many years that has been, but I still remember the story. And um, I think the reason that the story and the television episode hold up so well today is, is that the story is so elegant. Dahl gives us a very dark resolution to this murder story. Most memorable, of course, is the brilliant story twist when the detective in the final scene eat the leg of lamb while talking about their futile search for the murder weapon, which, as one of them says, could be under our very noses. I remember as a middle school student, I thought that was quite clever, and I still do. <laughs> while Hitchcock directed 20 episodes of television, he actually approved the hundreds of story ideas for Alfred Hitchcock Presents, and he had this directive for all of his selections. He said one important factor should be common to all of them. The ending should have a twist, almost to the point of a shock, either in the last line or last situation. Hitchcock twists tended to be like the punchline to a joke, even if the story is serious. While Lamb to the Slaughter is not a comedy, the summary almost reads like a headline you'd find in The Onion. And then when one cop says, well, you know, the clue could be right underneath our noses, she lets out this unnerving laugh. 
we dolly into her face and she's kind of grinning and she looks into the camera and we see her madness. <laughs> now Hitchcock would recycle this shot again for a great effect as well in the ending of Psycho, uh, but it works really well here. And once you have this twist ending, the rest of the film falls into place. Everything then has a purpose as a misleading setup to prepare the audience for the punchline at the end. The aspect of suspense, I think that seems to be somewhat of a lost art. I don't know if, or it, it doesn't seem like people today have the patience or the intention span for it. And I think it's something that you can do very cheaply if, you, if you're just kind of looking at the budget of a production. Uh, this was all camera techniques and, and skill of a director. The suspense model in this episode is essentially identical to the model we outlined in episode 7. Hitchcock begins by withholding information from the audience to pique our interest. Darling, something the matter? When Charles comes home, he avoids eye contact with Mary at almost all costs. She goes to kiss him and he turns his head, and right at that moment, the music stops. All of a sudden, the whole mood of the episode changes. She starts asking him questions, and he does not respond. And his silence after the second or third question makes the audience very uncomfortable. And this discomfort builds, uh, builds tension, and it lets the audience know that something serious is about to happen. Now, while his back is turned, she is telling us, the viewer, that she's pregnant, she asks about his day, she wants to make him supper. She is like the ideal wife. She is Mrs. Cleaver, right? Through the use of hard lighting, Hitchcock is able to make him look a little more menacing. Every, every time they show him, he's lit hard. The background's dark behind him. What does he say? I'm leaving you. I got this chick. She likes me. I like her. You know, we're going to try to make it work. It's all good. Patrick, I won't let you. Try and stop me. In step two, the protagonist commits a crime. And this comes as a shock to us. So we're immediately curious about how she's going to get out of this. She covers up all the evidence. We follow Mary as she creates signs of a struggle phones a friend, shops for veggies, and carefully puts the final touches on the crime scene. By uh, today's standards, the pacing of this of Hitchcock, and particularly this episode, is quite slow, and I don't think a director could get away with it today. But there is one moment where that slowness just works so nicely. What was fascinating to me was to kind of see her in this daze. I mean, she's eating grapes. She even goes to put the seeds in the sink and rinse her hands off. She's alone in the scene. There's nobody for her to talk to. And she just sits, she sits at the table. And then and we actually watch her just exist in that moment. It's like she is totally just acting on instinct. And you get to see it live. Now the audience is invested in the cover-up. When will she be caught? Will she be caught? The way Barbara Bel Geddes chooses to play Mary um, is one of the, the great things about this, this episode. And she plays Mary as almost not even a housewife, but as a, a child. There's something about her voice and her, her eye movements. We see her eyes darting about. In order to create that tension, Barbara Bel Geddes darts her eyes up and down, left and right, left and right, blinking as fast as she can. And this innocence helps the audience with the idea that you're gonna root for her when she, to get away with murder. We see the cops getting clue after clue, leading us slowly to unravel the mystery. Nobody else knows what she did except us, so each move the police make to solve the crime becomes an enjoyable dance. As they get closer, Hitchcock flashes Mary's guilty reactions to tease us. And just like in One More Mile to Go, police have the evidence right in front of their nose and still don't notice. But I think we accept it because we see how the police can't see past her 
as a housewife in order to see her as the murderer. We see them as the guilty party for their um, inability to see who she really is. It's easy to see why Roald Dahl's short story, Lamb to the Slaughter, would have appealed so much to Hitchcock. It was ideal subject matter for a director fascinated by sexual politics and marital tensions. The dark humour inherent in this story about a murder that the wife commits using a frozen leg of lamb originally destined for the dinner table is also extremely well suited to the tone of Hitchcock's work. It's something that the director would have found quite irresistible. Given Mary Maloney's subservience to her husband, there is a dramatic logic to the way that she rebels using an item of food that ordinarily she would have served up to him at the dinner table. And it's the leg of lamb's normally harmless, innocuous status as part of the domestic nurturing environment that Mary's associated with that makes it at the same time such an unlikely murder weapon and therefore so invisible to the detective's investigative gaze. We all know that Hitchcock in real life loved his food, but what's fascinating is how throughout his career he employed various forms of food imagery within his films. He never did this gratuitously. Food and food-related settings and objects are always integrated in ways that are richly significant. And they often express a whole range of gender anxieties and desires on the part of both the male and female characters in his films. The greater economy demanded by the conditions of TV production arguably prevents Lamb to the Slaughter from developing some of the other facets to Hitchcock's food imagery that can be found elsewhere. But the brevity of the episodic format perhaps accounts for one of the clearest illustrations of this very idiosyncratic preoccupation in the director's work. In using food to stage a memorable drama of gender rebellion, Lamb to the Slaughter is vintage Hitchcock. We've now reached the halfway point on our journey through the Hitch 20. We're starting to understand his camera style, his visual language, his story tendencies, and his models of suspense. In the next 10 episodes, we'll be looking for even more surprises.